thank you very much for the welcome and the introduction. Uh, so indeed, I'm talking about the social determinants of social care today. Um, social care often referred to as long-term care in international literature. And I think most of us, when we think about adult social care, probably think of the term crisis. That's what tends to come to mind. Adult social care crisis. It feels like those words, those phrases belong together. But the framing of the debate on adult social care, uh, this is now not clicking, but let's try this one. Yes, it is. Brilliant. Um, three aspects of the framing of the debate around uh, adult social care that I wanted to start with. The first is the idea that the crisis in adult social care, the problem of adult social care is one of ageing. Uh, so very often the way in which we're introduced to the idea that there are pressures in adult social care is because of uh, population ageing. And that's from government, it's from uh, third sector organisations, um, and it's from uh, the media as well. The second uh, aspect of framing is that what we need to do to fix social care is to reform the way in which it's funded. And some of you will be familiar with the very long and sad history of failures to reform the funding of adult social care in England, uh, going right back to a Royal Commission in 1999, which recommended uh, care that should be free at the point of use, at least as far as personal care is concerned. Boris Johnson was the latest to uh, attempt and believe and claim to a fixed uh, adult social care uh, with the health and social care levy and a lifetime care cap. But as you probably remember, that levy was scrapped by Truss and the care cap itself has now been postponed. So that remains a, a preoccupation, uh, creating a lot of political heat and not very much light. The third aspect of framing of, of adult social care policy is that uh, alongside the funding fix, we need a service fix. And the service fix is to integrate health and social care, that we've got too much of a division between health services and uh, social care services. And if only those uh, would talk to one another, work together more effectively, we would solve the problem of adult social care. Um, that's often seen in the form of uh, bed blocking or referred to in the terms of, of bed blocking, a horrible term, uh, referring to people who are uh, in hospital, who no longer have uh, acute health needs, could be living independently or in a care home, but for whom no, no suitable place is available. So those are the three dominant frames, I suggest, of the adult social care debate. And what I want to put to you today is an alternative entry point, an alternative way of thinking about what the problem of adult social care really is, and that's about social and economic inequality. So I've talked a bit about the current framing. I'm going to go on to talk about the social determinants approach as an alternative frame. And then I'm going to go through some evidence on the inequalities in care need, inequalities in access to care. And that's uh, going to be a substantial part of the presentation, uh, looking at inequalities in public spending, in access to formal care, access to unpaid care, and overall unmet needs. Uh, then inequalities in the experience of care. And in all of these, I'm going to be trying to look at this both through the lens of economic inequality, looking at both at individual level or household level, measures of inequality, economic inequality, and area level where possible, and at the, the important social stratification of ethnicity. And then I'm going to wrap up by talking about uh, what we might draw uh, from what I've presented. The scope of my talk today, at least as far as the empirical work concerned, is England. Uh, as you know, other nations in the UK have uh, slightly different arrangements, um, and of course, more broadly, across uh, Europe and the rest of the world as well. But I think the fundamental argument about how to think about adult social care, uh, I hope has, has wider applications. So those of you with interest in other parts of the world, I hope you'll find something in this uh, for you as well at the conceptual level. I'm gonna be focusing both on adults of working age and older people, so both above and below uh, the age of 65. Um, although as you'll see, as we go through, 
uh, the data on uh, people of working age who draw on uh, care and support are much less well suited to this type of analysis than uh, the richer data that we have available on older people, which likewise reflects, of course, the framing of adult social care as being a problem of ageing. Um, and I'm focusing on the people who have uh, need of care and support. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, I really like the definition that the uh, organisation Social Care Future put forward, um, that needs are the needs to live in a place we call home with the people and things we love in communities where we look out for each other, doing the things that matter to us. That seems to me uh, a very full and um, rich definition of what meeting people's needs uh, who have additional needs uh, might look like. Um, but in fact, the kind of operationalization that's available given the data that we have is a very reductive form. So that's based around uh, a number of activities of daily living, things like uh, whether somebody can get out of bed, whether they can use the toilet, whether they can take the right amount of medicine. Those would be all examples of ADLs or activities of daily living and so-called instrumental activities of daily living, things like getting out of the house, going shopping, doing the housework. Those would be called IADLs or instrumental activities of daily living. My focus here is indeed on those people who have the additional needs for care and support and not on those who are providing that care, whether that's family and friends or whether it's the paid care workforce. Um, but as some of uh, Mary Daly's work has um, pointed out to us amongst, amongst others, um, there is a, an interdependency between carers and those that they care for. And in many ways, it doesn't make sense to look at uh, the well-being or the meeting of the needs of the one uh, without looking simultaneously at the other. OK, so if we think about what this social determinants frame might mean, the literature on the social determinants of health is, of course, huge. Um, what are some of the key insights that we can draw from that that might have a useful application in the case of social care? Uh, well, going right back to Dahlgren and Whitehead uh, in 1991, one key insight is that health outcomes are substantially driven by people's living and working conditions and less by health services. Moreover, that economic inequality in those living and working conditions gives rise to pervasive health inequalities and that that accumulates uh, throughout the life course. That other forms of social stratification, in particular ethnicity, uh, but also other forms of and basis of discrimination and marginalization operate intersectionally with those uh, economic inequalities to create uh, particularly acute forms of health disadvantage. And that this runs right through from the needs in the first place, the kinds of illnesses uh, and conditions that people have through the access that they gain to healthcare services and the experience that they have when they are treated uh, in healthcare. All of those uh, have social determinants and that therefore health policy must be about more than healthcare because it needs to encompass the living and working conditions uh, that affect all of these aspects. So how does that look if we translate it into the context of social care? Well, just as with health, people's day-to-day -day quality of living, the kinds of needs that people have uh, help with through uh, social care, is also substantially driven uh, by their living and working conditions. And social care services can only ever be a very small part uh, of that overall picture. And then we might ask whether economic inequality does indeed give rise also to, to pervasive social care inequalities across the life course, whether discrimination and marginalisation are apparent, whether there's evidence that needs, access and experience are socially determined, and ask what all of that would mean for social care policy to be about more than social care services. And those questions in red are the ones that I'm going to try and speak to uh, during the course of my talk today. We had a very interesting seminar earlier in the term here um, from Nathan Marnie about commercial, commercial determinants of health. 
Uh, and I think there's a very interesting agenda uh, to be developed around commercial determinants of social care as well. I know there's work going on in the department here uh, in relation to commercial determinants, if you like, of children's services or outcomes from children's services. Um, but uh, again, I'm not, not going to be able to speak to that uh, today. OK, so turning first then to inequalities in care need, I'm thinking about this, first of all, in the frame of disability. So needs for care and support, broadly speaking, uh, arise from disability. And I'm construing disability here broadly in the social care, social model sense of limitations in being able to pursue the life that you value arising from a combination of your circumstances and the environment you're living in and your physical or mental uh, condition. Okay, so it's apparent already from that definition of disability that the circumstances and environment that you live in, the things that make your health condition disabling, are socially determined. They're things like your housing. Is your housing adequately adapted to your needs? They're things about your uh, local area. So those are clearly and directly strongly associated with both economic inequalities and uh, ethnic inequalities. But what about the other part of the definition of disability, those illnesses, injuries, and impairment? Do we actually know which of those are most prevalent among people who have needs for uh, care and support day to day? And is there a social gradient in their instance? Well, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, you'll be relieved to hear, but this is a, a short literature review on the main categories of illness, injury and impairment that for people of working age uh, give rise to needs for help with day-to-day -day activities. Uh, and then what evidence we have of whether there are social gradients in those types of conditions. The middle column there uh, is taken from the statistics on the primary support reasons, as they're uh, called, that people who receive support, working age people who receive support in England um, are classified under. So nearly half of working age people who receive support from formal public care services um, are classified as having a primary support reason of learning disability uh, and then 30% for physical conditions and so on uh, through the table. And to, to cut a long story short, the broad conclusion from this review is that in relation to each of these major categories, there is evidence of a strong socioeconomic social gradient and uh, in many cases, uh, ethnic disparities as well. However, it's not universally the case. And I think it's important to draw attention to the exceptions because a, an account that is completely uh, one-sided um, doesn't convince uh, anybody that there's a, a, an underlying mechanism here. So in the first category, learning disability there, um, although there is evidence of a number of mechanisms that mean that, for example, pregnancies may be less well-managed for people from lower socioeconomic status, uh, more um, premature births, low birth weight babies, more exposure to toxins during pregnancy, illness during pregnancy, complications not well managed during birth and so on, all of which are associated with a higher risk of a baby uh, being born with learning disability. Nevertheless, there are other conditions such as Down syndrome, for example, uh, which has no social gradient whatsoever. So there's nothing inevitable about this. There are specific social economic processes that give rise to these uh, social gradients, um, and they're apparent in, in uh, many of these categories, but not absolutely all of them. Similarly, uh, a similar exercise in relation to older people, people aged 65 plus. In this instance, the um, primary support reason classification uh, of those who receive support from public services isn't very helpful because about 75% of the classified as for reasons of physical support. So instead, what I've done here is to take proportions uh, that come from a analysis of care home residents and the conditions that they 
uh, report the diagnoses that they report. Obviously, there is a difference between care home residents and the distribution of impairments there and people who are supported in the community, but it gives us a rough idea. And the prominence of uh, dementia in those who have care needs is, is um, well known, I think. And the story is very similar here, um, that very many of these conditions that give rise to needs for help with day-to-day -day living have a strong uh, social gradient, a whole range of different mechanisms, including, for example, here in relation to arthritis, occupational exposures. So people who have heavy manual work, people who are driving vehicles that exposes them to continuous vibration, uh, have uh, nearly double the risk of developing arthritis uh, in older age. And that also speaks to the insight from the social determinants of health literature about the cumulative lifetime exposure, that things that happen in people's working life are having effects on their needs for social care uh, in later life as well. OK, um, so much for the underlying conditions, but how does that translate then into actual uh, levels of need? OK, uh, so back into thinking about inequalities in care need and here uh, I'm now looking at the over 65s where we have uh, richer data. This is my analysis of the Health Survey for England and I've pulled across three years, 27, 18 and 19 uh, in order to get uh, decent numbers, but still uh, looking at a pre-pandemic period. And I'm looking here at quintile groups, so fifths of the income distribution, the whole household income distribution, and the average number of activities of daily living or instrumental activities of daily living out of a total of 13 uh, that are asked about in the survey, uh, with which people say they need, they need help. Uh, and uh, the lines each represent a different age group. Here I've got 65 to 69 and 70 to 74. And you can see already uh, that the gradient is apparent from those in the lowest uh, income quintile group having higher numbers of uh, ADLs and IADLs with which they need help, uh, even at that age group, uh, than the highest income group. Uh, and then if we add in the uh, 75 to 79 age group, the gray line there, we can see the gradient is steeper. In fact, the lowest income group have four times as many uh, ADLs or IADLs uh, than as the highest income group at this age. And then the 80 plus uh, age group there on the top, a similar gradient, but uh, flatter at the bottom. Uh, and I think that what may be shown there is a degree of selective survival. So that the people with the lowest incomes, uh, only the very healthiest are actually still present in the data at age 80 plus um, and, and hence the platter curve. We can, despite pooling three years of data, we can only look at very broad ethnic uh, groups. Uh, so here just reporting on white, uh, black and Asian. Uh, and we've got the ages now uh, along the X axis there. And we can see that by the older ages, 75 to 79, 80 plus, uh, both the black and Asian ethnic minority groups are showing higher levels of disability uh, than their white counterparts. That holds even after we actually control for age fully. Um, but in fact, if you include household income as well, or, and, it, and even if you do a, 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 an intersectionality between uh, ethnicity and household income, uh, we find that ethnicity is no longer a significant variable. So it seems to be mainly driven um, by economic inequalities rather than ethnic stratification at this point. Here, an, a different classification this time at area deprivation level. So this is a, a neighborhood level measure uh, called the index of multiple deprivation that many of you will be familiar with. And again, uh, looking at quintile groups, so the fifth most deprived neighborhoods uh, in England compared to the fifth most deprived neighborhoods in England. And again, split out by ages. And we can see that uh, through all of the uh, age groups, those living in the least deprived areas have the lowest levels of disability. Those living in the highest, de most deprived areas have the highest levels of disability. And again, these are very strong 
relationships, these are substantial gradients. So three times, 3.7, nearly four times as many uh, ADLs, IADLs with which people need help if you're living in one of the most deprived areas. And this area effect or area variable remains significant even after controlling for your own household income and ethnicity. And in fact, there's an interaction between household income and area deprivation. So being in a low income household makes more of a difference if you're in one of the most deprived areas than it does if you're in one of the least deprived areas. And again, pretty substantial effects. So five times as much difference in the uh, most deprived areas compared to the least. OK, so uh, we've seen that there are inequalities in needs. But if services are organized in an entirely proportionate and well-targeted way, we don't necessarily have to see that translating into uh, unmet need. It could be that services, uh, if access is also uh, arranged in such a way as to meet those needs, it might be uh, that <coughs> that compensates for the very strong social gradients that we see in need. Publicly funded care in England is targeted on the lowest income, so it's a means-tested system. Uh, those with higher levels of wealth or income uh, don't get access to public care at all in, in social care, unlike in healthcare. And it's organised at local level, so there's potential for local authorities to target resources on areas within the local authority that have highest levels of need. Moreover, there is some recognition of the variations in needs according to deprivation, in the grants that uh, local authorities receive from central government. The formula takes account not only of population age and size, but also to some extent area deprivation in the amount that central government gives to local government uh, for adult social care. It's called the relative needs formula. Um, but as um, we heard from um, Ben Barr a couple of weeks ago, the uh, amount that central government has transferred to local authorities has been one of the main targets of the austerity period. So this central grant has been declining in uh, relative terms to other sources of income which local authorities have had to raise or draw on in order to pay for adult social care. So more and more has depended, in fact, um, on local council tax uh, in order to pay for adult social care. And that can be seen in this chart here, where the dark grey section is the amount raised through council tax, the social care precept or, or council tax precept for social care um, over the years between 2015 and 2019. And the problem is that that social care precept is inversely uh, related to deprivation, inversely associated with local area deprivation. So the councils that are wealthier, have the lowest needs, but also have the most capacity to raise uh, additional funds through um, uh, the social care precept. So if ever there was an example of government undoing its own work, this is it, right? So on the one hand, the grants to local authorities factor in the fact that there are additional uh, needs associated with deprivation. On the other hand, they skew local authority funding towards a, a principal stream of revenue that has exactly the opposite effect. And the result of that is, not surprisingly, that there is almost no relationship between spending on adult social care per head and uh, levels of deprivation at a local authority level. So the spots here are each uh, local authorities, and they're showing the expenditure per 100,000 adults uh, in this case, uh, working age adults on adult social care plotted against the, uh, in this case, in the top diagram, the average IMD score, the average neighbourhood IMD score for each local authority. Uh, and in the bottom here, the extent of uh, deprivation in each local authority. Just as a little technical aside, the IMD, of course, is a neighbourhood level uh, indicator. So there's no some single way to create a local authority level indicator. There are different ways in which you can aggregate 
neighborhood level information into local authority information and some people here who've spent a lot of time thinking about uh, those kinds of indicators and what those different patterns of inequality within a, a local authority uh, might mean for the experience of inequality so these are just two two ways that you can you can look at it but there are there are many others but the takeaway here is that uh, the uh, overall association between deprivation at a local authority level and spending is pretty weak. That you, you've see, see it's a sharp eyed amongst you will see that there is a regression line plotted there, uh, but the gradient is uh, very slight. For the age 65 plus is a slight stronger association, um, but again, um, a very wide distribution of spending. It's not uh, a, a strong association when one compares it to the gradients in need that I showed you uh, a few moments ago. Okay, so that's the uh, expenditure. What about the actual services that people are able to access? Well, this again is from Health Survey for England, and we're looking at any help from a paid helper in the last week, which is about 8% of uh, the older age group who receive uh, report receiving some sort of help. Now, this is both paid for help and uh, publicly provided, publicly funded help. And you might expect in relation to, say, uh, household income, those to move in exactly opposite directions. You would expect lower income households to have more access to public care because it's means tested. And you would expect higher income households to have more access to private care because they can afford to pay for it. Uh, well, what we actually find, um, looking at this uh, middle section here uh, with the uh, income groups, is that the lowest two income quintiles, the lowest two fifths, have substantially lower, significantly lower access to formal help of any kind than the highest income group. So the institution of public care, whilst offsetting to some extent the social gradient that would otherwise exist if it was a pure private system. Um, and you can see that because these lowest two groups actually have pretty much the same uh, marginal probability of receiving uh, services. Whereas if in the absence of public care, the lowest uh, income quintile group would have an even lower uh, access to uh, formal care than they do. Nevertheless, that is not sufficient to offset the advantage that the higher income groups have in terms of being able to purchase their own care. Other stuff on here, I'm controlling for the amount of help that people need. So the number of ADLs, IADLs uh, that uh, they need help with, which not surprisingly is significantly associated with getting help, also with age. Uh, then below the income, household income, we've got area deprivation. Uh, and we can see there that the gradient here um, is not consistent with the patterns that we saw previously. Um, the second and third uh, least uh, deprived areas seem to be the ones uh, with least access. But in fact, the um, estimates here are very similar. So it seems to be broadly flat. That's consistent with the picture of expenditure that I showed you with a very wide uh, distribution of expenditure relative to deprivation. Uh, and in terms of ethnicity, somewhat surprisingly, uh, the black ethnic minority group appear to be more likely controlling for income, area, age, level of need to receive some formal uh, services compared to uh, the white majority group. Looking at the working age population, this is a different data set. This is from the Family Resources Survey um, and a slightly earlier pair of years. A broader definition of uh, disability again, which is less well tuned in to those who need day-to-day uh, -day care, but a similar list of the type of help uh, that people might be getting and a similar uh, set of controls, although no uh, area deprivation. Around 13% of the, this age group were receiving some sort of formal care. And we see a, a very sharp gradient in exactly the same direction as we saw for the older population the top income quintile group being 22 percentage points more likely than the lowest two fifths of the income distribution to be receiving care. And again, the fact that it's the lowest two fifths, I think, is uh, underlying the significance of 
the importance of public care to the very bottom of the income distribution. Here for the working age distribution, uh, the black ethnic group is significantly less likely uh, than the white ethnic group to be receiving formal care. But as we know, formal care is a minority of the social care is provided. The vast majority of day-to-day uh, -day help with living is provided unpaid by families and friends, uh, whether share it in the same household, co-resident or not co-resident. So nearly one in five of the over 65s uh, in the Health Survey for England reported receiving some help uh, from an unpaid helper in the last week. Um, looking then at the patterns of who gets uh, that unpaid care, again, controlling for the amount of care that's, that's needed and uh, age, we see the opposite gradient in relation to household income. So those in the lowest household income quintile groups are the most likely to be getting uh, informal care. And so I think that's a, a, a clear indication of the way in which unpaid care is filling the gaps, filling some of the gaps left by uh, formal care, uh, inadequate formal care. But it also, of course, raises some very significant questions about the carers themselves, the people who are providing that unpaid care, who are likely to be drawn from the same uh, socioeconomic backgrounds as those uh, who have the needs for care. They're in the most deprived areas. Uh, they're predominantly in the most deprived areas. They're predominantly in low-income households as well. Um, so those implications for unpaid carers is, is a very important subject in its own right. And my colleague Nick, Br Nick Brimblecombe has, has written very interestingly on, on that. OK, I'm going to skip through the um, working age in order to get on to the sort of summary of, of uh, unmet need um, and then um, on to experience. So putting this together and thinking about, OK, so we've seen uh, what the levels of need are. We've seen uh, who's getting access to formal care, public and private. We've seen who's getting access to unpaid care. How does that all add up in terms of who has unmet needs? There are many different ways to measure unmet need. It's a contentious topic in the social care literature. Um, there's a concept of care poverty introduced by Tepo Kroger, which is quite nice in so far as it tries to bring in the uh, context in which people are uh, receiving or not receiving care rather than a, a purely individualized measure. Um, but again, uh, what we have in Health Survey for England is, is quite reductive. It's simply a count of the number of uh, activities of daily living or instrumental activities of daily living, which someone has identified they need help with, but they don't then uh, receive help with that ADL or IDA ADL. And that means they neither receive formal nor uh, unpaid help with that particular need. And troublingly, we see almost exactly the same gradient in unmet need that we saw in need a few slides ago. So by household income quintile, uh, a very steep association, particularly in the older age groups, uh, between having a low income and the likelihood of having more uh, unmet need. Uh, an upwards gradient in relation to area deprivation, um, particularly noticeable uh, in terms of the uh, 75 to 79 age group, a little bit flatter when it comes to the 80 plus age group, but a very high level of unmet need uh, amongst that age group. Uh, across all uh, deprivation quintiles. And by ethnicity, um, for the over 65s, um, despite the high level of formal care that the black ethnic minority group are receiving, uh, the levels of unmet need, particularly in the older age groups, 75 to 79 and 80 plus, significantly higher uh, than for the white ethnic groups. Uh, similarly, in terms of uh, inequalities and unmet need for the working age, very high levels of unmet need, again, a, a very broad concept of unmet need in the Family Resources Survey, and the lowest income quintile group, 21 percentage points more likely than the highest quintile group to receive no help at all. So inequalities in need, inequalities in access. What about those who are, shall we say, lucky enough to receive some public services? How do they experience uh, that care? Well, this is uh, 
evidence from the adult social care survey, uh, which is a survey of nearly 60,000 service users in England, adults of all ages. Uh, and uniquely, it's a survey that includes people in residential care and uh, nursing homes, as well as those who are receiving care in the community. And uh, as, again, Mary's work on the COVID period um, underlined for us, this residential care group are often overlooked and sidelined in, in policy. And I think it's particularly important to uh, have this evidence on their experiences through this survey. So one of the indicators in this survey, uh, one of the questions is which of these statements best describes how the way you are helped and treated makes you think and feel about yourself, makes me feel better, doesn't affect me, sometimes undermines how I think and feel about myself, or it completely undermines how I think and feel about myself. And looking at this by broad ethnic classification, we see, to my mind, shockingly, that more than one in 10 across all ethnic classifications are saying that the way that they're helped and treated sometimes or completely undermines how they think and feel about themselves. And there are differences across the different ethnic groups with the black or black British group being particularly likely to say uh, that that's their experience of the care that they receive. Looking at that in a multivariate context, if we put together the different non-white ethnicities, uh, collectively they have two percentage points statistically significantly more likely uh, to feel sometimes or completely undermined. And looking at that separately for the two broad age groups, uh, that also holds, and indeed, if restricted only to the uh, community setting as well. There are a number of other indicators in the survey which we can look at in a similar way. Uh, people who say that they feel less than adequately or not at all clean or presentable, that they don't always get timely, uh, adequate or timely food or drink, they feel less than adequately or not at all safe, and so on. These are very basic standards for any service to meet. And yet we're seeing between one in 20, one in 10 uh, of all care recipients saying that the care they're receiving are not meeting those extremely basic standards. And worryingly, across all of these indicators, those who are black or black British or Asian or Asian British, sometimes one more than the other, uh, are reporting higher levels uh, of concern on these indicators uh, than the white majority group. I'll, I'll skip the deprivation. It's, there's not a lot of um, uh, uh, action on uh, area deprivation in terms of differences in these inequalities. And we unfortunately don't have a, a measure of um, household income in that survey. OK, so to try and uh, begin to wrap up, first of all, just to um, put out there some of the limitations that I'm aware of in what I've presented today. And I'm hoping that you're going to tell me about lots more uh, when we come to the uh, discussion. We've got limited data on the care needs of, of working age people. I've done what I can in terms of pulling it out of the family resources survey, but it's not designed for that purpose. It's, a, it's an income and expenditure survey, uh, not a survey designed with questions about care in mind. So it's, it's rough and ready. We've only working with crude ethnic classifications, the small pooling years across surveys, uh, and much more might be revealed if we were able to look uh, in finer grained detail there. Similarly, we've got limited statistical power for exploring intersectionalities. Only occasionally have we got enough uh, to, to examine that. Um, we've only got data on those who are in residential care uh, from the ASCS. The other surveys are household populations only. Uh, in the formal care section, we're unable to separate public and private care. Um, and that means that we've got two, in a sense, opposite dynamics going on at the same time. And as I've flanked already, uh, I've largely abstracted uh, people who draw on care and support from the carers who provide it in this presentation, uh, which, which is, is not, I think, the ideal way to do it. OK, but drawing it together, what, what do we think we can say? What do I think we can say? Um, first of all, in terms of needs, that a majority of conditions and impairments that give rise to needs for uh, adult social care do have a strong social gradient, and many are more prevalent amongst people from minoritized ethnic backgrounds. 
And moreover, those people are concentrated in geographically disadvantaged areas. We saw that there is some attempt to recognize that additional need in the central grant allocations, um, but other funding streams undermine, uh, as it were, the good work that's done in the funding formula. Uh, Means-tested access to public care does smooth the gradient at the bottom of the distribution in terms of access to formal care, um, but not enough to compensate for the advantages of the wealthier in being able to buy the care that they need. Informal care for the over 65s compensates to some extent, uh, but that in turn raises concerns about um, the cost that those who are providing that care may be bearing. We know that those who are caring on an involuntary basis, it's not a role that they've chosen, but feel that they have to do, and those that uh, have longer hours of caring uh, without support are the most likely to uh, suffer long-term uh, health and other consequences. Levels of unmet need are high in all age groups, but they're strongly concentrated in the least well-off. And the experience of people from minoritized ethnic backgrounds of the care that they receive, those few who do receive care, um, are significantly worse than their white counterparts. So I think this adds up to an argument for reframing what is the problem of adult social care. It's a problem of inequality, it's not a problem of aging primarily. Uh, and it's a problem of economic advantage and disadvantage rather than being about uh, transfers between different parts of uh, the wealthy population. So much of the debate about funding reform has been, for example, about protecting the inheritance of uh, middle class families who might have to otherwise sell the family home to pay for uh, long term care. That's about a redistribution between the wealthy lucky and the wealthy unlucky. Those who, for example, have a relative who needs uh, long term care for dementia or something like that. That's an important form of inequality, but it by no means exhausts the kinds of inequality that we're dealing with in adult social care. And I would argue it is not the most important or the priority to tackle here. In terms of the integration of health and social care, for sure, it's an important thing to do to make sure that services connect. I mean, it's a, it's a no brainer. Clearly, health and social care need to be able to work effectively together. But there's a much deeper way in which health and social care connect, which is what I've tried to draw out here, which is that they are both driven by the same social determinants. And that understanding that driver and that the way to fix social care inequalities is to look at those fundamental health inequalities and the drivers of health inequalities that we're familiar with from the social determinants approach, uh, I think would be a much more productive way forward. Social care needs more public funding. We've seen very high levels of unmet need in some of the results that I showed you, to you today. Um, and the way in which that is distributed needs to be considered in a holistic way, uh, not in this hopeless, self-defeating way uh, with uh, councils being given extra resources on the one hand and effectively having it taken away with the other. But I don't think that social care inequalities are going to be resolved by tweaking the funding any more than we would say that income inequality is going to be fixed by tweaking universal credit or some other aspect of the benefit system. What we need rather is to think about upstream interventions, pre-distribution, if you like, um, to tackle the inequalities in need, which then feed through every aspect of the social care system uh, to, to produce the inequalities that we see in terms of outcomes. And finally, I would argue that the terrible experience of care uh, that these uh, surveys and other qualitative evidence reveal for many people suggests that we need to have a revolution in who's in the driving seat, not only of social care quality assurance, but also in terms of social care policy, very much including uh, giving a voice uh, and agency to the most currently marginalised and minoritised. And I think the social care future movement is a very inspiring example led by people who draw on care and support um, to reimagine what social care looks like and then to try and connect that uh, to different aspects of the social care policy debate. Uh, and then finally, to support both paid and unpaid carers um, to sustain the kinds of high quality 
relationships that are required in order to transform the experience of care from one of absolute misery uh, into something that sustains a real quality of living. Thank you very much. <laughs>